Um, for those that have just joined, uh, we're just going to give it a few minutes um, for um, everyone, well, as many people as possible to join, uh, and then we'll start. And uh, people can uh, catch up if they join after that. Um, I should say the, the plan is to uh, record this session uh, and then after the presentation, we'll, we'll share that with everyone um, and also send out a copy of the presentation slides as we do with the first one. Uh, so if you miss anything or have got to jump off, don't worry. Uh, we'll make sure that comes out to you after this. Yes, yeah. What's this got to change? Yeah, yeah, confident. Yeah. Yes, yeah, yeah, it's going to be. I'll be here as well. Three days in your office. This will be nice. Just say, start chanting, you ready? Uh, just to say, um, those that just joined, we're just going to give it a minute and then we'll uh, we'll, we'll start uh, proceedings. Um, as I know, um, everyone's busy. Um, and I don't really want us to go over the, the allocated area uh, hour because I'm sure we've all got other things to be getting on with. So just give it a minute or so and we'll uh, start. Okay, I think um, I, th I think it's probably worth us starting. Uh, as I said, people can catch up uh, as and when they join. Uh, welcome everyone. Um, so this is the second uh, in the series of roundtable discussions, uh, specifically related to Protect GC terrorism risk assessment. Uh, those of you who joined us uh, at the last event we did, um, hopefully you received a copy of the presentation and and a recording uh, of the actual. Uh, of the actual presentation itself. Um, just so everyone's aware, we will be recording this session uh, and then that will be circulated to everyone along with a copy of the slides. So please don't worry if you miss something or um, don't get stuff down. Uh, we will be distributing those after this presentation. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Andrew Sanderson. Uh, I'm a, a partner here at Phil Fisher, uh, part of the dispute resolution team um, and uh, part of my uh, practice is in relation to um, looking after clients and their interests in terms of uh, areas such as the Protect GC and terrorism risk assessment, as well as a whole host of other things in that in that regulatory sphere. Um, I, you won't hear too much from me today. Uh, there's, there's a quick catch up in terms of where we are, um, but apart from that, the main uh, today will be from the insurance point of view um, and. The person dealing with it is sat to my right, uh, Scott Ingham uh, uh, from Matrix Global. Uh, Scott, will you? Yeah, we're trying to session. Could, could I, can I just ask that um, 
everyone goes on weeds, um, which will help with the ripple bit. Um, much appreciated. Um, so yeah, as, as I was saying, Scott will uh, Scott will give you uh, an introduction to himself uh, and uh, and what he will be talking about. We're also joined here by Chris Hotchkiss. Um, for those of you uh, that joined the last presentation, Chris um, gave a, a brilliant explanation in terms of the, the sort of practical assessments uh, it is in terms of compliance with this uh, potential le legislation uh, that's coming in. Um, and Chris is here today um, again. Um, but, but like I said, the, the main event will be uh, in terms of hearing from uh, from Scott. Um, just before we uh, just before we move on uh, to Scott, um, so the agenda for this morning, an overview of the project duty consultation uh, and an update on where we are. Uh, the aims of the proposed legislation is uh, key questions for venues and organisations, and then the main part, uh, the potential legal issues and practical solutions uh, organisations can adopt. So um, I, I'm not going to spend too long on where we are in terms of the consultation process, uh, primarily because we, we covered that last time in, in, in detail. But uh, for those of you who weren't able to join us last time, um, it effectively, uh, the UK government uh, is, uh, has been conducting a consultation process uh, into proposals for a specific uh, piece of legislation, uh, Protect Duty. Um, with the aim of um, ensuring greater levels of safety uh, in, in effectively publicly uh, accessible places. And, and last time we talked about what those types of venues were, um, what classes of venues and organisations would, would fit into those. Um, the consultation published back in February um, and has uh, received quite a, quite a high level of response uh, from varying organisations from you know, multinationals, from uh, local authorities, from law firms, from people within the industry. Uh, and it's, it's gathered quite a lot of um, quite a lot of information and quite a lot of uh, representation. Um, consultation ended on the 2nd of July um, and the initial way was that there would be some feedback. 20th of September oh. and then the 27th. And it now looks like it's going to be November. Thanks, Chris. Yeah, so, so, so uh, um, un unusually for UK government, um, it's, uh, it's, it's been pushed back. Um, we, were, we were hoping that we would have some uh, something concrete in terms of an update to be able to, uh, to, be able to provide you with, but um, uh, unfortunately, that hasn't worked out. That said, um, on the basis that something does come out in November, um, then we will uh, provide a, a concrete update at that stage uh, in terms of where the consultations got to, what the initial thoughts are, uh, that those those sorts of findings. Like, Chris, I don't know if there's anything you wanted to. No, we, we, what we expect to see from the response is more shaping around the actual legislation itself, and and hopefully, you know, be able to gather a bit more detail on on some key issues such as um, what a who falls within scope, um, you know, some more specifics around who's responsible. There's you know some key questions surrounding public spaces um, in terms of, of who is liable and who will be responsible for doing the assessments and, and the mitigation measures. Um, and then in terms of the, the timeline, as we understood it to be, um, the first reading in Parliament was, was looking to be in July of next year, um, with the potentially the legislation to be passed in September. With the delay to this response, we don't know if that's going to have a knock-on effect yet to um, to the actual reading in Parliament and the legislation being passed, um, but we will we'll wait and see. Yeah, so so as I was saying, in, in terms of, in terms of the aim of the legislation for those that went with us uh, last uh, last time, it is effectively to put in um, processes, policies, procedures uh, to ensure uh, greater safety um, within uh, public areas, publicly accessible locations, um, and uh, the point of the consultation was to um, garner responses from stakeholders. Um, as, as Chris said, there is um, there are still grey areas in terms of who will fit into what category, 
who will be responsible. Um, one of the questions that was raised at the last round table was, uh, you know, if you had a if you had a building that had a Starbucks in it and uh, it was leased and it then looked out onto a public square that was run by the local authority, who who would do a bit of it effectively? Yeah. Hopefully, then there, there, there may be some guidance in terms of that, or it may be left vague. We think, yeah, we think that we think that they're more leaning towards the um, making it vague, which means that um, owners and operators can have to err on the side of caution, um, and probably there'll be there'll be a multitude of assessments that will overlap with one another. Um, in, in terms of um, I, the reason I put this slide up is it, it, this was a summary of the the practical approaches that, that Chris was talking about in terms of um, the actions that would be required. Um, the the main the main reason for putting this up is, as I said, for those that didn't join, this is uh, this is what we were discussing in terms of the practical effects, what organisations, individuals, companies would need to be doing, uh, and what they need to start looking at uh, sooner rather than later. Um, I'm not going to uh, propose to talk through each of those because that, that would take up uh, an hour, hour of its own. But I think it's safe to say that anyone who's been involved in the health and safety space would recognise most of the key steps in terms of you know, identification of issues, risk assessment, um, interrogation uh, in terms of mitigation measures that have been put in place, and, uh, and then the, the review process that uh, that follows on from that. Um, hopefully, um, in, once we've had uh, an update of the consultation, we will be able to provide a little bit more, uh, a little bit more context and a little bit more. Um, information uh, in terms of what would be what's being required I, one of one of the questions that was asked was will the guide uh, will the will the government be providing any guidance um it's still not clear um my my hope is that they will uh, as they've done with other pieces of recent legislation uh, they've they've provided guidance in terms of compliance what that will look like and how detailed that will be who knows who knows so, um, as I said, the main point of today uh, is, is not to hear from my, myself and Chris, but uh, to hand over uh, to Scott Ingham, uh, CEO of Matrix Global. Um, Scott will give you a bit of background and uh, in terms of Matrix, what they do, uh, what they don't do, uh, his expertise, and then and then look at the uh, insurance aspect in terms of the protect duty. Uh, so, Scott, thank you. Thanks, Andrew. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, so, as Andrew said, um, uh, my name is Scott Ingham, I'm the CEO of Matrix Global. Um, we're an international financial and insurance advisory firm. Uh, we've been operating uh, since 2000. Um, I, I've been involved in the space slightly longer, uh, for uh, uh, just about 30 years, um, uh, in the broking and risk consulting uh, space, uh, as well as all, all the team members that work uh, for me as well. Um, and we've worked for literally thousands of organisations uh, through that time. Um, and uh, across uh, every kind of sector. A core um, area of our focus is optimising the balance between risk retention and transfer of risk um, to, to get that balance right um, and to uh, uh, optimise the, uh, the cost of risk ultimately. Um, in terms of the client experience that, that we've got, and I will, ref when I'm referring to things we're going through the presentation, we do talk about companies. The, the reality is that all the, the elements of what we're talking about relate both to the public sector and to uh, uh, the private sector. And our clients are, are right across the board. Um, so, you know, having worked for Shell and BP, where, you know, uh, people, uh, terrorists in the Middle East shooting at our contractors um, uh, when they're trying to install glass, um, uh, all the way through to uh, uh, working with uh, uh, other organisations uh, like an SSP who uh, operates across uh, extensive locations uh, in London and high target values where um, uh, organisations like that were specifically at risk to uh, terrorist events but also on damage uh, denial of access to the locations and impacts there. In terms of the, um, the actual uh, uh, general experience, what, what it has given us um, and, and myself is a, a very unique perspective on the, uh, the entire buying and risk transfer landscape. Um, uh, because with the background, we've uh, sat in all the, all, all the different roles. 
um, and our role working with organizations um, is to look at it from everybody's perspective in the process. You know, uh, all the stakeholders, the clients, brokers, and, and the insurers. Um, and, and certainly sit, sitting in that role uh, for uh, some uh, major organizations, the group risk manager, um, we uh, dealt with a number of events post World Trade Center, particularly uh, to do with uh, 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 anthrax um, uh, in one of the particular scenarios. Um, but sort of going back to um, the sort of specific element related to terrorism, which is obviously one component of, of what we have to deal with. Um, uh, my first involvement with that was uh, actually the uh, Baltic Exchange uh, uh, bombing. Um, and in particular, uh, I looked after uh, a law firm in London called Norton Rose. Um, and uh, it was actually the very first large claim I ever had to get involved in, um, where the building was completely destroyed. Um, every single desk filing cabinet was blown uh, through straight to the building uh, and, and out into the streets. Um, a, a massive event with a massive impact uh, to, to the organization. Um, luckily, they were fully insured. Uh, they did get paid everything uh, that the program was designed to do. Um, and on the run up to the renewal uh, of the program, um, when they were actually just uh, completing the uh, repairs to the, to the building, then unfortunately we had the uh, push up skate bomb, which blew the building uh, from the other side. Um, and uh, that was an interesting scenario because the partners actually had a discussion um, prior to that event about whether to renew uh, the cover or not. Um, uh, and the discussion of the, of the topic was it can happen twice uh, to us. So fortunately for them, they, they did. But I think the uh, the key about these types of events is that they have a seismic effect on organisations, um, regardless of what insurance is in place, um, both to the, the management and the personnel. And um, without que question, it did have long term impact uh, on that organisation uh, beyond the insurance. So, what what sort of uh, areas you know are we looking at with regards to um, uh, sort of the fundamental loss areas related to terrorism? So um, the legislation in terms of protect, which is coming in, um, is really very much focused around uh, uh, loss of life and, and bodily injury uh, and the protection elements there. Um, the the other area is, is obviously property uh, and revenue. Um, and really, these are sort of the, 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 the two component uh, areas that make this up. Um, and uh, in overall linking in, into that, you know, the, the, the key thing that will be affected um, is the enterprise value uh, of an organization that's affected by one of these events. Um, and it, it's you know, interesting when you do look at the data for the effect on, on GDP um, in terms of the uh, financial impact of the terrorist uh, attacks, which for the UK um, in the last 12 years is just short of uh, 40 billion. Um, and uh, there's clear correlation that post an event uh, uh, taking place actually has impact in terms of uh, investment in particular uh, areas. So, so wide ramifications. Now, um, I think the, you know, the challenge uh, working with organizations uh, uh, on what are difficult subject matters and things that people don't really want to think about uh, on a day to day basis um, is trying to get management to understand uh, the nature of it um, and to uh, uh, recognize that it's actually being a, a risk. Um, and I think the big thing uh, now is really the changing nature of terrorism, which we've seen uh, particularly over the last uh, 20 years. So historically, um, uh, the IRA in terms of UK uh, uh, mainland um, was very focused around collateral damage, uh, targeting specific uh, or, or targeting a very specific individuals. And in general, um, uh, there was an approach to uh, giving warnings uh, so that there was the least amount of uh, public uh, injury in general, general times. I think also what is actually something I, I would suggest that a number of people do if they, if, when they're trying to present this information, is if you just go on to uh, Wikipedia and look at a list of all the terrorist events that have taken place in the UK since 1970 uh, up to date, 
um, it, it is actually quite eye opening, um, uh, just the, the number of events. Um, and I think it's about trying to get that onto the, the radar uh, of organisations as it being something that could be relevant to them. Now, uh, in terms of the, the, the change, the, uh, uh, the biggest uh, swing has been to do uh, post World Trade Center. Um, and the introduction of uh, extremist uh, Islamic uh, terrorists uh, as, as, as the core group. Completely different objectives. Um, it's about maiming, killing, terrorizing, uh, uh, mass, mass disruption. Um, now, with these types of events, uh, like lots of things, you know, the statistically uh, low probability that something will happen. Um, but the reality is the impact, both in terms of property, operational, uh, and the, the, the mental related uh, aftermath of these events is, is, is extremely high. Um, and the, the other area which I, I think um, it's worth uh, uh, focusing on is that uh, a lot of organisations are buying terrorism insurance. There's a lot who, who don't buy elements of it. But um, the nature of terrorism has changed and, and was a significant issue to do with um, the actual extent of terrorism cover that's being purchased and it not being properly tailored to, to actually respond to the broader type, types of events that are happening. Um, and uh, under the terrorism uh, heading, there's a number of events that are taking place which are, are being defined as terrorism, then in effect the underlying uh, uh, drivers are there uh, to support it. So, so looking at how those policies are adapted uh, to tailor to, to your uh, particular needs is, is really very important. Um, I think just in terms of uh, 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 an overview of the general uh, driving the number of events, um, by the end of December 2020, that there was about 185 arrests for, for terrorist activity in the, in the UK. Now, it was 97 less than 2019, and, not, and that, that's obviously because of the pandemic uh, and the fact that there the, the wasn't the target audience that those types of terrorists were looking at. But even in those circumstances, there were still 185 arrests, and that's not even counting for the ones that obviously weren't uh, uh, discovered uh, or have been better, uh, known yet. So um, along with this, um, there's a, a shift in obligation um, uh, of our organisations to look at and consider what would be um, pretty extreme uh, uh, considerations uh, historically. So I think going back into uh, uh, you know, the 90s when you had the IRA there, there was a general view um, that a, a corporate organisation or a local authority they had to they had to be aware of it. They had to try and address it, but it was seen as being something that was a, a national related issue rather than an individually targeted uh, thing to do with an organisation with individual liability related to that. Um, COVID has completely turned that on its head. You know, because I know if if I stood in front of a board of any organisation two years ago and said you need to be spending a huge amount of money and time relating to preparing for a pandemic, which in reality these types of issues are building all the time, uh, you have got almost no, no traction on that conversation at all. So, so the pandemic has changed the nature of the perception and considering you know, the art of, of, of the possible uh, uh, and extending the boundaries that, that, that need to be looked at. Um, and because of that uh, and the development of the terrorism that we have at the moment, um, Boards just cannot uh, now afford to ignore these extraneous risks in, 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 in their risk assessments. Um, and we are certainly seeing and have seen uh, through the pandemic a, an enormous impact uh, uh, in terms of accountability uh, of organisations for how they've been prepared for these events, how they've responded to it. Um, and uh, I would think that probably most uh, people on this call will we'll be aware of, of the impact to it is uh, like directors and officers, officers of insurance where uh, the market has disintegrated effectively because the insurers have uh, on bulk withdrawn um, uh, uh, on scale um, and are waiting to come back post those events uh, where, where possible. Um, so the market will come back, it will, it will adapt and, and adjust. 
but as a result of that, it's increased the, uh, uh, the interrogation around these particular topics. Um, it's uh, asked about how are you assessing, how are you managing, uh, what, are, what, what are your plans? Because um, it's all ultimately from a corporate organization point of view, a defensibility uh, issue uh, fundamentally. So our sort of starting point when we work with any organization, and, and I think particularly related to this particular issue, um, is the approach should be to act as if you have no insurance. You know, insurance is, is a financial remedy to help support the impact, but it's not a replacement for fundamental uh, uh, corporate governance and risk management strategies to, uh, to, protect, the or to protect the organization and meet its obligations to employees uh, and to the uh, public. OK, so um, the most affected uh, areas um, uh, of cover, um, uh, and I say the legislation is something that uh, it does appear is going to is going to come into play. But uh, I think our view is that the legislation is already there. So, so I think regardless of what happens with protect duty, um, there's a massively increased exposure to uh, 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 organizations for accountability because nobody now would ever be able to justify um, saying we weren't aware of this being a risk. They could have done it with the pandemic because it was so, so, so unknown as, a, as an event on that sort of scale. But it's quite clear that everybody is aware that there is uh, uh, terrorism uh, in our uh, lives, unfortunately. So key classes um, uh, that will be affected as we move forward um, will be areas like employer's liability. The core at the moment is that, uh, uh, that obviously they, they can't uh, exclude terrorism uh, on the statutory uh, layers being purchased. Um, and there's variable market uh, uh, availability um, for the excess layers. Um, again, I think even with that statutory piece, uh, as things move forward, um, uh, mat material disclosure, presentation of information to underwriters, um, and their acceptance of, the, of those risks and you meeting those obligations uh, will become a, 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 big, a more onerous responsibility. Um, and if it's not handled properly, even though they may still be liable uh, uh, under the statute to pay a claim, um, uh, there's quite, quite significant potential for uh, um, subrogation uh, actually against the client following. The other area that's going to be affected is, is public liability. That as it stands at the moment, it, uh, it is uh, available and covered in a number of different areas, uh, and that would, uh, depending on which particular type of product that, that you're buying. Um, but I, I think it's clear that um, if we do have a significant event right, which actually occurs, um, there is no question that the liability market will very, very quick, quickly withdraw. Uh, uh, well, oh, uh, sorry, I think. So, 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 liability areas um, are going to be a, a major area uh, uh, that will need to be looked at, and the market is going to have to, to, to adapt and respond to that as we go forward. Um, there's obviously property and business interruption, which there are. Key uh, uh, structured markets uh, for the moment in terms of uh, uh, obviously the pool re facility um, and an uh, and a range of alternative uh, uh, providers. But again, um, I think uh, I go back to an earlier statement, which is to do with the extent of the actual uh, coverage and how well tailored it is to meet the needs uh, of the organisation. And this was um, something that we went through with a lot of clients when they first started buying cyber liability insurance. A lot of organizations bought it um, because they felt they had to, but they didn't really quite understand and it wasn't explained to them clearly how it was going to respond. So there's been a lot of uh, adaption to those programs to move forward to make them much more specific. Um, directors and officers is going to be um, the, the biggest area uh, of contention um, and the most challenging uh, for organizations going forward. Um, uh, one, as it stands at the moment, if there's an event, your organization happens to be involved in that, 
um, it, it, it is a guarantee that there will be actions uh, against both the corporate entity uh, and the uh, direct officers uh, of the company. The existing legislation caters for already. Um, the protect duty is uh, uh, just a, an extra layer um, of obligation to uh, try and cover the bases as far as, as, far as we can see. Um, uh, and then cyber as well, um, uh, obviously, uh, uh, in terms of uh, cyber coverage related to uh, terrorism events, which can affect our organization. So, so, so those are the, the, the primary ones. There are, there are others, um, but uh, uh, that's where the bulk of the focus will be. So in terms of the, uh, what we see as likely to be the insurance market response to this, um, we feel it is likely to be, um, and will follow sort of a, a relatively similar pattern to uh, when cyber liability developed, um, and you had this increasing uh, responsibility to uh, to disclose, to provide information, to demonstrate ongoing management, um, and uh, you know we 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 see regularly um, very significant uh, organisations who are even unable to secure cyber liability because they uh, haven't got correct systems in place um, to satisfy the insurance. COVID-19, again, every questionnaire that will come out from any insurer uh, is blanketed with COVID uh, uh, questions. So, so a similar increase in the level of information that's going to need to be provided. Um, and and uh, an element of this is that um, insurer's position typically tends to be that we're expecting the clients to be doing these things already. Um, you know, so uh, you, you, you can't afford to get yourself into the position where um, you, you're not um, addressing it and moving forward through the, through the phases um, in terms of the uh, uh, undertaking and providing proof of risk assessment and uh, ongoing management. Um, as I say, there'll be increased uh, uh, underwriting um, and information requirements. Um, and there will be uh, an impact. Um, we're obviously in a adjusted marketplace at the moment in terms of insurance costs. So there's been significant rises in a, in a, a number of areas in the marketplace. Um, we don't believe that that is going to uh, follow historic cycles in terms of swinging back the, in the other direction uh, uh, very soon. Uh, it will probably plateau uh, uh, for quite a while. But as this moves forward and the market becomes more aware of the implications and the issues here, um, all of the previous comments we've made will then start to impact on what underwriters will want to charge. And it will be, if you're not doing those things, it will be increased premiums, reduced coverage, and in a number of cases, you'll have no coverage uh, available at all. So, um, so being ahead of the game on that uh, is, is very important. Um, and I think in terms of uh, the uh, uh, market, in terms of the response, um, you know, a key part of uh, any uh, communication process is to make sure that your organization's risk profile is structured extremely well, uh, it's integrated very effectively with your overall strategy. Um, and uh, certainly uh, in the current market environment, uh, where we're still seeing an, uh, a, a significant number of insurers who are um, not really wanting to compete for business, they're concentrating on their existing uh, uh, portfolios, um, then uh, getting the attention of uh, the right markets and getting their engagement will be supported enormously. Uh, by you being a better risk and presenting yourselves uh, uh, more clearly uh, as such. In terms of the, uh, uh, say, the insurance options, um, we obviously got Pool Re, um, uh, which is, uh, uh, you know, been a, a, a tremendous uh, asset for uh, the economy um, uh, that that being established. But it has very specific and clear uh, uh, mandate and objectives. Um, to provide cover so that so there are uh, limitations in, in that. But uh, again, that is a good example of how the market will develop uh, uh, going forward in that there'll be some core uh, elements that will be available, um, but we will see uh, as there have been alternate uh, markets uh, uh, developing as they have done uh, for property uh, and business interruption. 
the same will happen uh, for, for the liability related areas uh, and exposures. But again, all of this is going to uh, very much rely on the, the organization to uh, uh, manage and present themselves and communicate in the right way. Their intermediaries, if, that's, if, there's a, if there are broking teams involved, having the right skills and understanding themselves um, uh, to get the messages through. Um, because we do have an environment in the insurance market where there are uh, uh, there's a lot of uh, more commoditized services being delivered, um, which are more packaged. Um, and we uh, have seen a, a significant decline in uh, the standards of presentations and communication on risk uh, uh, to insurers by, by uh, a significant number of organizations. Obviously, for the larger ones, uh, they'll have they have more sophistication um, and uh, with the right uh, brokers uh, in play, then um, that will help to make sure the, uh, the, the structure comes together well. Now, um, in terms of just the approaches for uh, insurance coverage, um, certainly for the larger organisations, uh, we think it's quite likely, along with a number of other classes that, that is happening to at the moment, the, the utilisation of uh, an insurance captive uh, could provide significantly more flexibility um, in terms of the, the actual structure of the cover that an organisation wants to buy and being more in control um, and also being able to access uh, insurers through, through the reinsurance markets. So, so we think there'll be quite a significant uh, uh, increase in adoption uh, of captives and alternative risk transfer structures uh, as we move forward. Um, the, the, the challenges for the, for the organizations are many. Um, uh, and, um, you know, we, we've sat in, you know, endless meetings uh, uh, where there's debates about cost and there's debates about time and impact and necessity uh, uh, to undertake these things, which you'll be dealing with uh, uh, on a daily basis or across a whole raft of a certain raft of areas. The most important thing for, for this, as with any risk management strategy, is this has to be a top down. It's got to be uh, engaged by the senior management, um, otherwise the strategy will never be as effective uh, as it should be. And it is difficult to get uh, uh, that engagement and for, to help uh, people understand you know, the nature and the impact of those potential uh, risks to the, to the organisation. Um, uh, in fact, we, uh, Chris and myself, had a call uh, with a, a, cl a, a client um, a few weeks ago um, who operate uh, 450 restaurants in the UK um, uh, to discuss this very particular subject. Um, and uh, the message fundamentally from, from that, their perspective was, uh, when does the legislation come in? Um, okay, well, I'm not going to do anything uh, because I've got Martha's Law to implement already, which is costing us money, the recovery from the pandemic, these, type, these types of challenges. Now, the, the issue there um, is that, um, as with, uh, and as Andrew uh, confirmed for anybody, is that uh, if you take an active decision not to do something, uh, it, it really is a bad decision um, because it automatically uh, creates a, a potential liability. So um, the most important thing is to uh, actually take it forward. It doesn't need to be complete. The, the, you have to have that management engagement uh, now. And I say the, the, the protect duty is just a very big stake to overlay what already exists uh, uh, as an exposure to the organisations. Um, budgets are always a challenge in terms of in terms of allocations, um, uh, logistics of implementation. Um, certainly for uh, larger groups, um, uh, we see that there there, there are some quite uh, big issues for them um, in terms of rolling out and deploying uh, uh, assessments, deploying training and integrating into those systems. And uh, I, I think there's a, a, a risk of focusing around the protecting duty piece on its own um, and uh, being behind the curve, because our, our feeling is that there's momentum building very significantly now and, uh, on this particular topic. I think the insurers are still trying to, to get to grips with it themselves. 
that very quickly they're going to start putting in uh, uh, these question sets. They're going to be requiring it at renewals that will be in advance of the implementation of the legislation anyway. So, so leaving it further down the line could uh, uh, cause some quite significant challenges for organisations to have an effective and smooth uh, rollout. And the other uh, group in here, um, uh, obviously there's a, there's a massive stakeholders uh, internally and externally to organisations. Um, for us, we have a, a, a very large involvement with uh, investors, private equity uh, funds, um, and uh, uh, everything to do with uh, uh, ESG uh, uh, and the overall governance and protection of their investments. Um, and uh, it is a guarantee that this is going to be on their agenda. Um, and it will affect uh, these organisations decisions as to whether they'll actually invest into some uh, uh, groups. Um, one of the parts of the conversation we had uh, yesterday um, was for overseas organisations uh, owning operations in the UK, um, where uh, the uh, the shared space uh, element could cause very significant exposures to them that they wouldn't want to have. So we can see uh, investors uh, and groups changing and realigning their strategies uh, about how they actually uh, structure uh, their assets and uh, how they actually compartmentalize the various uh, subsets of Christmongies, for example, uh, that they might have as concessions uh, on their sites. So the stakeholders are, are incredibly uh, important to this. Um, and uh, key areas, subject matter expertise. Um, and uh, as I said, you know, we were with a mass uh, of people down the years um, uh, in every uh, every space. This is a very specific subject matter expertise area. Uh, it's not something that the majority of organisations uh, have uh, the background and the knowledge uh, to be able to um, uh, implement uh, successfully uh, themselves. There will be a need for external uh, support. And so in terms of the forward actions and, and where they go, uh, first thing is to engage a competent person, um, uh, as you would do in a number of roles uh, within the organisation. Um, uh, a difficult individual uh, to, uh, to define, um, but uh, that individual is going to be critical to you being able to undertake an assessment to understand where you are and then to integrate that into your forward, your forward plan. Um, it is, uh, without question, to say, unlike uh, most business operational risks, um, uh, which are uh, relatively traditional, um, uh, and uh, the uh, even the large organisations um, will have people who might deal with uh, aggravated uh, uh, assault uh, scenarios, uh, uh, attempted theft, these type, the, the, these types of uh, particular high risk. Uh, areas, but understanding the nature of uh, uh, the terrorists, uh, their planning, their thinking, and then being able to relate that back into a plan, and having built a number of these myself, um, it is a challenging task. Um, in terms of uh, that as an issue, um, as we have seen down the years with uh, uh, things like Y2K, corporate manslaughter, you know, the sort of the never ending cycle of these um, additional pieces of legislation coming through, um, the market will flood with potential providers. Um, and without uh, question, very, very few of these are going to have the expertise required. Um, so uh, you need to be very cautious um, in terms of who you choose to, to engage with um, and setting a, a, a high standard. Uh, for the background and the skill sets of that organization, not just to do the assessment, but also to assist you in integrating it into your own structured uh, 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 risk management program, um, and also being able to support you with appropriate uh, uh, measures which will achieve your goals and also satisfy the external uh, uh, regulators and entities and stakeholders that um, uh, will bring into question uh, uh, your decision making um, in, the un in the unfortunate event that uh, you are involved in, a, in one of these scenarios. Um, so uh, from a lot of organisations, um, part of the thing is, is really trying to understand the implications 
uh, where we, where we are and 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 planning ahead. As I say, you know, uh, it's un, it's a little bit unpredictable in, in terms of the timescales and how protectors you will come in. Um, but at the same time, all of these exposures currently exist. So for a lot of organisations, uh, certainly giving uh, immediate consideration to to a high level review of the implications. Uh, which can be used as a, as a board and risk committee uh, uh, document to start that planning and consideration. And, and that in itself will help to uh, reduce and start laying the groundwork for you meeting your obligations uh, and demonstrating that you have considered and you do have a, a plan for moving forward. Obviously, it needs to be built into the risk register because a lot of what we're looking at here integrates with building services, with uh, uh, health and safety uh, uh, related issues. Uh, as standard, uh, definitely want to involve uh, your insurers and your uh, your brokering advisors and their risk teams uh, in, in this process, um, because if it's managed effectively, it will uh, reduce the the costs of actually implementing uh, uh, this process because there's a lot of data points within those groups which will assist you in accelerating the process of being able to implement this um, it needs to be integrated into the existing risk management and the business activities um, right from the top down to the to, to the employees on, on varying levels uh, but the reality is that people need to know what what to do uh, if something happens um uh, and currently most people uh, don't um so uh, that engagement right through the chain is something that people will will will, will look for and certainly um uh, being involved in, in an event which uh, uh, now that covid is improving to the degree that that it is and we've seen you know in the cities particularly a a very very substantial increase in uh, footfall um, it, it unfortunately is going to just be a matter of time uh, before these attacks uh, uh, start again. Um, I think very, very important um, is uh, ins say ensure that your uh, risk advisors and your, your broking teams uh, and your own internal uh, risk management and compliance teams uh, are uh, properly engaged and working with a very clear a uh, strategy to manage this into, into the markets. Um, uh, we spend a huge amount of time with organizations undoing um, presentations and repositioning those organizations because they've just been very badly communicated. And uh, with the market, um, like most things, once you've set perception, it's then very hard to move them back to the landscape you want them to, to, to be in the first place. So, so getting that strategy right is, is very, very important. Okay, um, and that is in terms of insurance. Thanks, um, thanks, Scott. Um, I think there's um, a bit building on what we said uh, last time around is that there's a lot there for, for people to and yeah. you know, organisations to consider. And you know, uh, I know there's still a lot of discussion in terms of when the legislation is going to come in. When are we going to be, uh, I suppose, compelled? Maybe it's the wrong word. Well, I don't know. Compelled to do it as part of the legislation. I think. I think the message is that people need to be looking at this now. Yeah, you know, it's it's that simple, really. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I mean, this is this is not hard. It's just got. It, it, it's it's like lots of risk-related uh, elements. Um, it's just got to be put on the agenda properly. It's got, it's got to be built in. Some of the, the, the key elements are very specialist skill sets that are required, which, which an organization will need that additional support for. But there's a huge amount in here, which is just an extension to what they should already be doing anyway, okay. uh, effect, to manage effect. And Chris, yeah, what, what you're saying is that if, if an event does occur, um, those people responsible for that organization that's affected will be liable. If they haven't, if they fail to put mitigation measures in place, so you don't need yep. the protect duty to find yourself falling foul. Yeah. Um. You know, if something does happen and there are casualties, your organisation and directors themselves can be held liable. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. But, but I think you know when you come back to the to sort of the core of it, uh, you know, the reality is that uh, all organisations um, want to look after their people. 
you know, the human capital. Um, uh, and uh, doing these is part of uh, looking after the, uh, the business uh, centre by looking after the, 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 those individuals. Um, and I think um, because, you know, it's one of these things where all of us uh, have had exposure in a variety of different ways uh, to these particular types of extreme scenarios. Um, uh, which terrorism just happens to be one, but we're getting involved in a, a, a significant array uh, of, of events um, that uh, you don't want to be looking back uh, after this type of uh, an event happens and there is significant loss of life uh, or there is a massive impact to the business and thinking we absolutely could have done something different about that because that is when not only will there be uh, without question, extensive liability uh, on, on individuals. Um, you know, the fact is that the, you know, the ongoing trauma to people who are involved in these events yeah. it, it, it is lifelong. Um, so, so doing things to help give people that comfort. I think the, the other thing as well is that this will fall into uh, uh, sort of the, um, uh, uh, the sort of the framework uh, uh, the lots of organizations have to complete when they're providing services to other organizations and you know where they're going to be asked you know so, so for example you know a good example is if you're staging live events and you're going to have uh, you know an Ariana Grande type, type event now you can guarantee the people ensuring that event and, and her or any of these artists coming in they're going to be asking these things now about the event organizers yeah. because they see that as a, a, as a critical risk exposure to the organization. So it, 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 it's all completely manageable and doable. This isn't, it's not a rocket science, as they say, uh, um, but it is a, a subject area which we do recognize is difficult to get on the agenda properly because, you know, who wants to spend more time thinking about these, these types of things on a daily basis? Um, but it's a necessity um, and done properly, it, it, it will be a positive impact to, to, to the business internally um, and with its customer base and its employees and, and its investors, whether it's a government entity or whether it's a, a publicly owned uh, organisation. Yeah, and I, I think uh, one thing you touched on was in terms of boards now sort of sitting down having conversations and then almost rejecting the need to do yeah. anything. It's, yeah. you know, it's just not it's not acceptable. No, I mean, I mean, it's, it's an absolute non-starter uh, uh, for you know um, because you know uh, this will fall under a number of categories of headings. The very first thing is about disclosure. You know, so uh, you know, uh, I think that's going to be quite a significant challenge for for a lot of organisations is how they actually do manage that process of you know are there any new risks to your organisation? You know, what are you doing around all these different areas? Um, and uh, you know that is your worst case scenario where people have discussed it, they're aware of it, and they just decide not to do anything about it, and um, for pure financial uh, uh, reasons in, in most cases. Um, but I say uh, with all the right parties and working with the insurers, there's a huge amount of support. There's tons of government support available uh, in this process as well, and obviously it varies in degrees depending on the scale of the. Uh, uh, the organisation. Um, but certainly for the, for, for, for the larger ones, this uh, it should be relatively easy to, once it's set up, then uh, it should be relatively easy to manage what, along with the, the rest of the integrated risk management yeah. programme. Yeah, put, putting my defence lawyer hat on, you know, if, you, if, you, if, a, if the board's had that discussion and said, we're not going to do this, then you know, if you're in an unfortunate situation where you're finding yourself being investigated or prosecuted, you know, me trying to argue that you should uh, get a smaller fine. <laughs> it's just not going to happen. Not gonna happen. Yeah. Um, in, in terms of those people that are that are listening in um, through, through P, does anyone have any questions or anything for the payment uh, like to raise? Brilliant. I'll, I'll, I'll take that as um, we, we've covered everything really comprehensively. That's that, that, that's superb. Um, as, as I said at the start, this is the second in the series of uh, discussions. We will um, we will probably 
aim to have one around about the time that hopefully the government does release uh, the uh, the consultation. And, early November, yeah. Yeah, so early November time, if they've sorted out the fuel crisis by then, um, and they can concentrate on that. But um, in in the meantime, in terms of this presentation, we will uh, we will share this with everyone. Um, and of course, in the meantime, if anyone's got any questions, would like to come back to uh, any of us, myself, Chris, Scott, whoever it may be, please, please feel free to get in touch. Um, but um, thank you ever so much for your time uh, and, and, and attending this has been much appreciated and look forward to uh, uh, hopefully maybe conducting one of these in, in person uh, sooner rather than later. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.